Um, as, you know, as you now know, Glenn Brown was supposed to be here. He has what he believes is uh, food poisoning. <laughs> so at uh, 5 30 this morning, you got an email that you say, so Wally Wells, fortunately, was here. And no Glenn stuck in there. But one of the things, Glenn was here, uh, one of his key messages that he wanted to get out today was the phrase sustainable service delivery. That's one of the, it's one of the things we want to start branding. And that kind of came about right, John, when we were developing the program and, and looking for, right, you know, how do we, how do we, Kurt, how do we get the messaging right? And uh, we crystallized on this phrase, sustainable service delivery. So that's why we repeated a few times. And in terms of this next segment, you know, there's the key statement. It's all about the money. As those of you in local government know, uh, usually if you're looking for grants, then you go meet with Glenn, don't you? And, uh, but money's tight. And so, uh, but he did, you know, the other key message was about thinking beyond the initial capital investment. So I think on that basis, I'm just gonna get your slide set up while you tell us who is Wally Wells and why are you able to step in for Glenn Brown at the last minute? Well, this is Glenn Brown with a mustache and 20 years older. <laughs> I don't know that he'd appreciate that. It took me a long time to get this old nub and cost me a lot of money. Um, I'm a civil engineer by trade. I've lived in BC for five years, worked across Canada all my life, uh, both public and private sector, mostly private sector, but almost all the municipal infrastructure. Mostly in the last 15 years, I've been involved in integrated asset management. Uh, currently, and uh, I, I used to use the word worker bee, but somebody in Wikipedia dictionary told me worker bees are all female, so I canned that term. Uh, I basically act as the uh, the daily resource person for Asset Management BC, and Glenn has his last slide here of who Asset Management BC is, and I'll take uh, one or four minutes, depending on what the clock tells me at the end, to tell you about that and what that resource is for you. So Glenn, unfortunately, uh, thinks he developed a bit of food poisoning, and he said a washroom looked an awful lot more attractive to him today than an automobile to come up from Victoria. However, um, I was scheduled to be here anyway. I didn't make it till near lunch because it was most interesting and Glenn was able to be on it. We had a conference call this morning with four provinces and seven municipalities, uh, all, all our Western people, talking about some of the very issues we're talking about in the room today. And just how we share information and, and uh, where some of the issues are going, not only in water but in asset management. So I'm not a water person per se, a little bit of me is water. The rest of it deals with the rest of our infrastructure and assets as well. So what we want to talk about is the five principles. Um, it's all about service. We, I had a good uh, talk to the Australian folks, thank God for Skype, it's cheap to talk to Australia regularly. They have an awful lot of the same issues that we do and I actually asked to borrow one of their expressions because one of their public works people said I don't need an asset if I don't have a user. And uh, I've remembered that one, and I think it's very good. We build all this stuff, but if we don't have anybody to use it, we don't really need it, do we? So I think the service level is, uh, is very important in this, and as you'll see this message coming through here. So infrastructure assets only exist to provide the service to the public. So Doug, thank you. Is that better? Thank you. Uh, the public or any user, be it the public or commercial, whatever the user is. Most of you are familiar, at least in the urban environment, with the uh, infrastructure under streets. Most of you also know, and doing excavation is way more complicated than that. We've got the uh, shaws and the teluses and uh, the gas pipes and the cross connections and everything else in there. It's about 10 times that more complicated, uh, plus the age in there. And often we get in even with contractors' drawings and find stuff we didn't, ever, didn't show up on the ice belts and we didn't know it was there. So uh, it can get look very simple, but we all know better than, than what it is. Um, <laughs> I like this slide. It sort of shows sometimes we don't define the end of a contract very effectively. <laughs> I love the last stripe on the road. The painting there was really important so we knew which side to end on. really two systems or two parts to our water systems as you know. There's our, our watersheds, either groundwater or surface water or combination for our water supply and then we get into our piping treatment and water delivery. Um, both the themes are going to come through and the principles associated with that. 
I, uh, I came from Eastern Canada when I moved here five years ago, and, and I think uh, Mike referred to the fact we don't protect our watersheds very much. Uh, my experience here is we protect them an awful lot better than we do in other parts of the country, and certainly control the land uses. And I've actually been quite impressed so far with what I've seen in BC of how we protect those watersheds, at least on surface watersheds. Principle two, once we have decided to offer the service, define its quality. We've had a lot of discussion in the integrated asset management around level of service, and level of service is about five different uh, levels, and when I say that I don't mean at the level offered, I mean the level at which we define it. The first one, and I'm not going to go through all five, but the first one really is a policy issue with your council. What level of service are we prepared to have our, our constituents pay for? Water normally demands a fairly high level of service. It's not acceptable to tell people that they can suffer through one, on average, one water main break a week. Uh, it just doesn't cut it. So some of the level, like a flooded street and a rainstorm and so forth, where the storm sewer makes back up, people are prepared to live with, so we can live with a lower level of service or without a sidewalk, very high level of service. The other end, obviously, of level of service is our performance measures and how we get into actually monitoring our systems. And beware of creep. Um, certainly my experience across the country is uh, where politicians don't understand what level of service the ratepayer pitch to them about what the level of service should be, and the next thing they're in the staff office telling you to do this, do that, and increase the level of service. It is very difficult to decrease the level of service. Once you've established it, trying to decrease it is extremely difficult. Here's uh, just some very quick examples of uh, some pieces of right from uh, a little problem with uh, contamination up in the lower left-hand corner and uh, to water tanks, pipe in the street, and uh, supply systems, dams. Level of service has a number of aspects to it when you get down into the middle areas of it, dealing with the financial cons considerations, what can we afford, uh, what do we need to afford. I remember a lot of discussions around municipality years ago about privatization of municipal services, and I think the decision really came down to risk and most municipalities I found were saying we're not prepared to privatize water, the risk is too high, but you know, being able to, to uh, go out in the street tomorrow if there's a strike and get another truck to pick up the garbage, the risk is a lot lower. So a lot of those decisions came down to risk. The strategic alignments, consultation, um, your asset understanding, and your risk tolerance, and I would say risk has become very important in there as far as your level of service is concerned with your financial. The others are important, but not all of those are necessary. This is a very interesting slide. I heard before about what we pay for cable. Well, there it is. Um, the top areas in the green really look at what we pay in our household. This got back into the discussion this morning of uh, we talked to people about paying half or a third of for their water, what we're paying for cable, and they bitch about it. Uh, these are very good to bring into our public sometimes as to what they're really paying for something. Look where the coffee bar is, for instance. Uh, compared to water. The second set of bars is rather interesting. The actual daily investment, uh, this is uh, City of Hamilton data, uh, in 2008 and the required. This is where they've done their asset management, looking what they should spend versus what they do spend. Interesting in here, you see that the water and the wastewater are underspent a little, like most of them, but not as bad. And one of the, one of the things, certainly across the country, where we have rate-based services, we have an opportunity to deal with the revenue stream much better than we do with the tax-based services. Uh, certainly I've experienced, and I'm sure a number of you have experienced, when councils have come back and made a public statement, we're going to, uh, thank you, we're going to reduce the taxes 5% this year, and every, every department's going to take 5% cut. All of us. taking five percent cuts. Unfortunately in public works where we've got water and uh, up and sewer on rate base, the five percent goes to roads. So it's not unusual to see a very high bar like that on the, the roads. Uh, a number of municipalities and I believe my own municipality in Nanaimo also, there's a formula and there's all sorts of formulas around the country on the water bill to fund sewers. 
Uh, they vary all over the place as to, to what they are. I've seen them as low as 20% of the water bill to 125% of the water bill, which goes into a sewer fund. Australia recently started, and I've seen them a little bit in Canada, and I don't know enough about the water billing in BC yet to know whether it's there. Is there some thinking now coming back and funding storm sewer rehabilitation also by the water bill? Uh, I just don't know how much that's been done. It is being done in some areas. I heard comments earlier about uh, uh, fire flows and uh, not going into the sewers, but the storm sewers are watering grass or watering driveways and going down into the storm sewers. And there's some rationale to consider uh, allocating some of the funds from water. So I think the question came up, do we make a profit from water? I don't know if, that, if those were done, would we ever make a profit from water? We might from the water directly, but how it's funded and used would, uh, would not allow for a profit to be made because we'd still likely be underfunded. Principle three, with the level of service come operations and maintenance requirements over the life cycle of the asset. We're having some really interesting discussions right now when I say we in the asset management side of things of maintenance. Um, I had a lengthy discussion recently with the executive director of the Government Financial Officers Association. We're really learning how to talk to each other and what to say to each other because he reminded me that financial officers put in front of council a statement of capital and a statement of operations, but not a statement of maintenance. Uh, and the maintenance in a lot of cases with our finance people isn't necessarily on their radar. And our answer, but, 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 yes, but we need to understand our maintenance costs. Oh, but that's not the way our finance people do things. So. We're, we've been starting some of that dialogue now, and then the question came up, well, what is maintenance as opposed to operations? We haven't really um, come to grips with that. The closest we've come is said maintenance has something to do with sustaining the value of the asset or adding to the value of the asset as opposed to deteriorating it. And just think of your car as an example. You maintain your car, you sustain the value of the asset as opposed to let it deteriorate to the point it's going to cost you 4 or 10x. But we need to understand the maintenance costs, and uh, we've just been invited to attend the financial officers meeting in Saanich the, in three weeks uh, to talk with financial officers and technical, I believe it's a joint meeting actually, about where do we go as a result of the PSAP data and what do we all collectively need to do together to start putting these things into place and work together a little better to understand where we end up with. This is a, a good indication of cost. It's interesting, this was put together by the Homeowners Protection Office. Um, one of the problems we have, I think, when we capitalize projects, and this is, I know some of the national associations have said to Infrastructure Canada, one of the difficulties with the stimulus funding is you're capitalizing new assets. When we, quite frankly, we've got a lot of assets on the books right now we can't afford. And I was aware of one case in Peachland where actually they turned down a project uh, because they, it was a curling rink and the curling association who was going to assume the rink just said to the city, quite frankly, we can't afford it. Well, thanks for building it, but we can't afford it, so don't build it. Um, I've seen, uh, this may be prevalent at home, most of the municipal infrastructure I have seen somewhere is in the 15 to 20 percent of capital costs. I think Tommy told me Nanaimo numbers are about 15 percent capital, 85 percent operating. So. We're faced over the next 20 to 50 years on our tax bills or utility bills of 85% of the cost of that. So when you look at your capital of a project, think of it as 15% of your life cycle cost as a, not a bad rule of thumb. Principle four, do the right thing to the right asset at the right time. This comes back to looking at your strategies, where you're at. Um, one of the criticisms we've had of looking long term 60, 70 years is we can't plan out that far. Quite frankly, we can't afford not to plan out that far. Uh, I have had to change my head as an engineer because I wasn't very happy telling you information unless I was about 85 or 90 percent certain of it. One of the financial officers at a workshop we had came up, sort of tapped me on the back, and he said, Good for you. The finance guy won't tell you anything if we're not 100 percent sure. Uh, I said, Well, so he said, You're 5 percent better than we are. But I've had to adjust my thinking here that if I'm going to put information in front of you that's 60, 70 years out in front of a council and a public, if I'm 30% 30, 30 satisfied with it, I've got to be okay with that. What's really important is how we refine the, the projects for the next four and five years in the database that we have for them. 
that's, that's really where you need to be. So the long-term plan of financial needs and macro will run out and you can be 30% satisfied with it. You obviously have to be 90% satisfied with your next few years. So don't be afraid of information that you know is a little dicey going out because we know it's going to get refined. Had we done asset management plans seven years ago, we would have had a very different picture than if we updated them today after this recession. So there's an example where short-term things can really have a huge influence. One of the things we were talking about this morning, City of Calgary was on the phone. Uh, their replacement value of assets dropped 20% in the past year when they've done their calculation based on the revised construction in Texas. And if you think of where construction costs were during the Olympic as opposed to what they are today, those numbers are going to vary. It also made me as an engineer understand why accountants use historical value as a baseline other than replacement value, which ultimately we need. So keep those things in perspective. This is what uh, happens with your maintenance costs if you don't do the maintenance. I heard of one municipality recently here in the province, council just slashed the road's maintenance budget from 260000 for the year to 140000 uh, Director of Finance and I were talking about it, he was telling me we couldn't get them to understand this factor of 4x up to 16x, that the road's going to deteriorate faster and it's going to be an awful lot more expensive a few years down the road to fix it. So this is just to, to help get that point across on deterioration. These are other slides. The bottom one is more towards roads where we're into uh, 20, maybe 20-year 20 replacements and so forth, doing our preventive maintenance, bringing, uh, bringing it back up. And that's where, again, I mentioned before, trying to come up with a definition of maintenance, where you look at what your maintenance costs are in relation to uh, <coughs> excuse me, your asset and uh, bringing it back up to value and, and enhancing the value. I used to do a lot of work with National Defense and they had about $8 billion worth of assets and they were basically trying to say to the politicians, if we spend 2% on maintenance, we've got on average replacement of all of our assets in 50 years. And those were the fixed, not mobile assets. 50 years might be good for if you took some 70 and some 80, but more important, they're trying to say to the politicians, if we're only spending 1%, we're into 100 year replacement. If we're spending 2%, we're into 50. And that's again the discussion partly which we had this morning, what's the value of having a at least a macro view on your maintenance costs in relation to the value of the asset. You can look at what that window is for replacement. Principle five, all infrastructure activities are interdependent. Non-brainer, I don't have to explain that to you, you're in the business. Um, there is a correlation, obviously, direct correlation uh, between some of the water and the sewer. Where's the water come from that goes in the sewer? Um, when we fix a street, we've got pipe underneath it. When we fix a pipe, we've got a street above it. Too many cases that I've seen, and I'm sure you have, where we dug up the, the pipe one year, or dug up the street one year, replaced it, paved it, and then dug up the pipe the next year, and had to repave the street. Our utility companies are probably the worst at that sometimes. If, uh, many streets I've seen repaved and gone in, and the next year the utility company is coming in and tearing it up again. So those things are all cost dependent for us. Uh, community vision and service delivery, we're really getting to the point where we've got to say to our publics what kind of service levels do you want in all of our assets. And once I think our politicians direct staff accordingly, then the staff can do our job. Uh, too many cases of staff are is being put down by the politicians to the staff and we're stuck. Uh, what is appropriate on a change in service level in that and there's no guidance for us. So there's really a lot more emphasis that we're putting out there now on, on what is an acceptable service level. What is asset management? Uh, I think we have many definitions. I was part of the National Asset Management Working Group. This is, uh, I, we'd modify this one today. Uh, I really think it's, it, it does deal with effectively managing our assets and long-term planning. And the word that isn't in there that should be is operations and maintenance. Uh, the early definitions talked about engineering and we now have differentiated substantially between engineering and operations and maintenance. In fact, I know too many large municipalities around the country where engineering and construction and operations and maintenance don't talk to each other. Um, I don't understand that, but that happens all the time. With smaller municipalities, unfortunately, it's much easier to do that. Why asset management helps in avoiding problems and potential crisis. Provides better and consistent levels of service to the public at less cost. Reduces risk to the community when these things are understood. 
that proves the evaluation of return on investment. I'm not a provincial employee, so I can't speak for the province, but I know the discussions we have had, and I think if you look at your grant application today, the planning grant, at least for the grant that you're applying for, there's already a requirement on there to look at life cycle costing for that particular asset. Don't be surprised down the road to see that extended to, you know, have more likelihood of winning your grant if you have an asset management strategy in place than if you don't. Um, I can say it because I'm not a provincial employee, but keep that in mind. Um, last part of that one, asset management leads to more effective communication with ratepayers. Um, Red Deer have a beautiful, I wish I, I still had it, it was so popular it got taken from me. They have a nice little lapel badge that says, I love assets, with a nice big New York style <laughs> heart in it. And it really did a very marvelous brochure to try and explain this, this whole concept to the public. So it's getting out there. You'll see very soon, we just did an interview with the mayor of um, Saanich, Central Saanich, on some of their asset management strategies that they put in place. And his comment was really worth remembering, and it said, if you take the solution to the public without them understanding the problem, the solution becomes the issue. And boy, was that ever good advice. So what they have done in Saanich, and we'll be posting this presentation very shortly, is they have really done their asset management strategy to determine what the problem is, but they've also financially now come to grips with some issues of how they can get sustainable somewhere between now and about 2025, depending on the asset by certain strategies of raising rates, changing taxes, reallocating funds, whatever it is. But one of the first that we've seen in the province that has that full plan in place. Whether council, excuse me, whether council can accept it and whether the public can accept it, we'll see. But at least the information and data is out there now for the taxpayer. Seven questions of asset management. Um, I think you're probably familiar with this and piece out driven some of the first parts. What do we have and where is it? Amazing, uh, I just found it amazing across the country. Uh, we have 4,000 municipalities, a good number of them have no idea we own. We wouldn't do that with our houses or our own businesses. But uh, we've now resolved some of that sort of thanks in one way, a piece of bugged us, but it got our attention. And uh, we now at least have an inventory. If it's on historical data, we at least know that. We can work with the numbers and, and where we go with them. Condition can be done over time. Uh, getting into remaining life, uh, again, that's a 30% estimate in some cases. Level of service we talked about. And then where do you go in your plans, your capital and operating plans, and how do you come up with your financial plan, including risk assessment, which is very key. So I'm just going to finish in two minutes on Asset Management BC. A few years ago, I mentioned the National Group that did a, a framework for Asset Management for Canada, which I was involved with, as was the province. We realize that one, it's like a shoe store, one size cannot will never fit, fit all, and there is one, not one approach to asset management at all. Uh, you have to tailor it to what you do in your community, how you do it, and what's best for you. I know there's a, a lot of computer salesmen out there telling you their computer program will fix every program will fix everything for you. It won't. But it's a good tool, and it is a tool. It's part of the chest if you want to use it but it's not necessarily that where you need to be with things. The province decided to take the next step and say to our communities, we need to deal with asset management, particularly if we want to make the grants appropriate and plus the tax structures. I was lucky enough to become involved with that early on and using our national experience, we decided to approach the associations. We felt the best way to do it was approach all our associations, UBCM, Local Government Managers Association, BC Water Waste, Public Works Association of BC, Planning Institute of British Columbia, Government Financial Officers Association, MMCD, and the Center for Infrastructure Management at BCIT. I also said to the province, based on experience, do not share this committee. Do not share the working group. This cannot be a provincial group telling us and our municipalities what to do and how to do it. This must be us working together to bring our collective knowledge as we are here today to the table. Our chair is Stan Westby, who is the Chief Administrative Officer of, of Power River. Our Vice Chair is Andy Wardell, who is the Manager of Finances for North Vancouver, and Gord Brown, who was in Campbell River, I'm sure many of you know him, now in uh, Manager of Operations for West Kelowna. We have all of those associations on the working group, plus we have representation from a number of the municipalities, uh, of the different forms of municipalities around the province, 
We also have First Nations because the issues associated with deteriorating infrastructure are no different than First Nations. The funding model is, but getting to what our problem is is no different. What we have done to date, what you're seeing here is the website, which is operated by, uh, for us by Civic Info. It's going to be repositioned uh, within the next few weeks. We have done a number of, of uh, studies. Some of them are on the website. We were asked for an asset management draft policy. It was circulated some time ago. It's on the website. That's a policy that you can take and look at and take in front of your council, and it does two things for you. Basically, it makes a council commitment to asset management. Secondly, it basically empowers staff to proceed with asset management, but it doesn't put a time frame or a dollar to it unless you want to do it. So the policy is strictly for you as a guide to draft in accordance with what your municipality wants. Last year with Infrastructure Canada money, we did a study which involved 40 municipalities around BC with interviews to some 200 people. We decided to do it in personal interviews because it's hard to know what interruptions you had when you were filling out a questionnaire and how you actually filled it out. The interviews were done in political, CAO, engineering, operations and maintenance, planning and finance in some 40 municipalities. We learned a lot. One of the things we learned was the interview process in itself was effective to determine whether your position within your community and in your municipality to undertake asset management. No surprise to those of us that have been around the business, there was huge differences across the municipalities and, and there was huge differences within the municipalities. We had one municipality, which obviously I won't name, but uh, the Chair of the Public Works and the CAO understood asset management very well and therefore believed their community understood and we drilled down into the organization. There was a very poor understanding in some of the departments as to what actually they were going to do, what asset management was. There's a new tool that will be on the website in about two weeks. There's actually a workshop next week on it called Asset Smart. That tool is basically to allow you to take that same form of questionnaires and look at your own municipality and determine what resources you have, what resources you might need, how do I develop an understanding across the various disciplines of the municipalities. We, have, uh, we also are publishing 11 case studies. Uh, most of those are done. They will, all of this is going to be up on the web if it isn't there already uh, within the next about three weeks. Um, what else have we done recently? We'll have our first copy of the asset management newsletter out. There is a dialogue box on this. You can see discussion form, which you can go in and post your questions and, and ask them. And we've had quite a, a, a limited but some very good questions come forward that we try to get answers for immediately. I had a call from uh, Lytton recently was just looking for some assistance on something. All we did was able to, to direct the municipality in the right direction to get the resources and the help they needed. We have, uh, I've been back home today, I probably would have gotten it completed. We're just awarding a study to a consultant on the basis of four planning grants and local input, $55,000 uh, for, and we're involving Tofino, Merritt, Lake Country and Powell River as medium to smaller sized communities. Tofino rather unique because of the 1,800 people in the winter and 20,000 any day in the summer. Uh, that study is going to produce a generic roadmap. If you have found out that you're positioned to do asset management, the next question is what do I do with the limited resources, limited money I have now? And one of the municipalities said, I can take half an operations guy providing we didn't have a water main break today and a total budget of 50 grand this year. And so what do I do next? What can I do in order to bring forward my asset management strategy? So we wanted to do this roadmap, which should be open about six months uh, since we get the consultant on board. That is again, this. so our objective is to give you the tool chest uh, and feedback from you as to what tools you need and where you need to go with it in asset management PC. So that's uh, given the end of my presentation and we can get back uh, another 10, 15 minutes of discussion. Okay.